Good morning, everyone. Thank you, or good evening, wherever you are uh, today. Thank you for joining us for uh, today's edition of uh, 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 Water Unscripted. And uh, this special edition today is about women. We're celebrating today International Women's Day. And what better way to have this discussion and having uh, great uh, water leaders around us and sharing their insights. Also, uh, I'm happy with the audience we will have, and I invite you to also please share your comments and your questions on in the in the bottom uh, on, the, on the question side. So I start first by bringing in our speaker. So first we have uh, Arno. So hi Arno, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Thanks for having me on board. Thank you, Arno. Arno is the executive vice president of uh, Veolia Water Technologies and is joining us today from France. Thank you, Arno. Then we have uh, Dr. Milka Weidner. Thank you for joining us. For you, Arno, it's a uh, very short early morning from Denver. Correct. So, thank you. Dr. Milka is the previous. Me. Thanks. Dr. Mika is a previous uh, chief executive officer of Denora Water Technologies. And also recently she started, she founded Diversity in Water, which is excellent. Thank you for this initiative, uh, Dr. Uh, Wilder. We also have with us today, uh, Professor Savik. Professor Savik, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, Wilder. Thank you. Professor Savik is a chief executive officer for uh, KWR Water Research, and he's also involved in many studies and many, many research uh, programs in other universities also. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Mrs. Uh, Venner. Thank you. Uh, just a second. Sorry, I lost my title. So thank you, Ifetayo, for joining us today. Uh, you're joining us from, uh, where did, did you mention you, you are today? Florida. Florida. Okay, so thank you for joining us. Uh, she's the president of uh, the Water Federation, uh, Environment Federation, WEF, and uh, also Ifetayo is uh, vice senior vice president in uh, Arcadis. So thank you for your time. Thank you for having so great. Thank you. Thanks. I think I went through the whole uh, our all our speakers. So thank you all for being here. And uh, my first question for you on on today's event. So. What are the benefits of having more diversity, gender diversity in the industry? Because we talk about it a lot. So what are the benefits of having uh, diversity, but also equity in, in the uh, water industry? And most importantly, how do we make sure we communicate this to all the stakeholders so it's not just a, a nice to have uh, exercise? So maybe Professor Savik, you can go ahead. Okay, but um, I think it's, for me, it's very clear because uh, in the water industry and um, in the research field with, uh, within the water management, I think we have a, a very uh, high competition for getting new employees or getting the right employees. And those who feel that they're being treated fairly, equally, if you wish, um, are more likely um, to uh, do their best for the organization they work for. And also, um, if you want to, uh, if you need to replace um, employees, uh, it's very expensive. Um, it costs company or organization to do that. So equity can reduce turnover uh, by increasing that feeling of loyalty and, and satisfaction. And also in the recruitment. So I think there are lots of benefits that can come uh, from having diverse uh, and um, equitable organization. Thank you, Professor. I know. I, I think you want to say something. I see. No, 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 no it's fine. clearly. I think it has been demonstrated by many studies that in each business is bringing diversity around the table is, is quite key. Um, and and I think for me, especially in the water industry, because we are not dealing with. Uh, I would say a normal product. Uh, we are dealing with an essential product. We are dealing with an essential services uh, on which communities are building up their life. So we need local, we need global approach around this topic and diversity is helping us, I would say, to, to approach new ways of dealing with the water challenges. So clearly one of the benefits, exactly as said uh, Professor Savic, is 
talent pool, how we attract and we maintain our talent pool, how we enlarge this talent pool with more than 50% of the world population, uh, clearly, we, we, and how also we, we can have our teams working better on more complex topics and having different perspectives. So clearly diversity for me is, uh, I would say, the cornerstone of the sustainability of our industry. Definitely, definitely. Dr. Mirka. Uh, yes. So um, for me, diversity, equity, and inclusion are not just uh, check the box activities, something that's on vogue now. Everyone talks about it. To me, we need to keep the business in mind. And for me, it's really the prerequisite for innovation. It has been said many times that the water industry is a bit of a lagger in terms of innovation. And that's not surprising to me. If we continue to ask the same people the same questions, we, we need to expect the same type of answers. So in order to drive innovation in the water space, we need to tackle both parts of this equation, right? We need to ask different people, people with non-traditional backgrounds, unusual experiences, um, different perspectives right? that can be gender, but there can be many other things as well. As different people, different types of questions, and that's how we will really drive innovation. And in this world where, and I know we will get to, into it much further, there are such challenges and opportunities. We need that innovation, so we need to broaden that perspective. I mean, basically, also you mentioned innovation, uh, enlarging the talent pool, which makes sense. I mean, if you're tapping on half of the population available, so we're not going to have. It's a competitive advantage, in fact, to, to have. But but what are the barriers? I mean, we're trying to bring in more women in the industry. We understand the need, and you have cl clearly highlighted it. What are the barriers of having more women uh, in our industry, and how we keep them? How we can keep them? I can I can tackle that. So I think. Probably one of the biggest barriers is really just not a lot of people don't have a awareness that a water sector even exists, right? So we don't do a very good job of communicating and being out in the public, right? And so a lot of the studies that I've seen, certainly a recent study in the U.S. said that um, we, the water sector here is about 15 percent women. And I've seen that the number is maybe around like 18, 20 percent globally. So it's pretty low. So if most of the people I think that have gotten into the sector have gotten in because they knew someone or knew of someone in the sector. And so if most of those people are male, um, you may be sort of bringing in people who look like you if you don't tend to you know, look out and expand your network to reach out and bring other folks. And then on top of that, now you have folks who do look at the sector. If they are looking at the sector, they don't see people who really look like them. So they're less maybe inclined to think that that's a sector where it's going to be welcoming for them or that they can advance. So I think um, that's one of the big barriers. And I think a similar barrier, you know, when once you come into the workforce, when especially, you know, looking up, um, you know, it, it, it's improving, certainly, but you don't see as many women up in the higher positions. So it, you know, a lot, it's a little bit more of a struggle to think, okay, yes, I can actually get there because, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of uh, folks mind you cannot be what you cannot see so we have to do a lot better at getting our stories out there getting our faces out there um, and communicating because we really do need to actually attract a lot more people in general um, to our water sector so that that would be my um, general uh, thing and I think probably the biggest thing that we can do to overcome that is to really show the faces and the stories of a lot of the women in the sector um, of various backgrounds, various levels, but just generally be more communicative um, in, in the water sector in general. Yeah, I, I like the, the, you mentioned if I about the stories. So today, one of our employees in, uh, in Tanzania, she wrote a great post about how, how happy she is of being in the water industry. And she mentioned also her dad, like how her dad did a good job in raising her. So, so she got there. So yeah, the story, stories are important because they also inspire other people to join. Uh, Professor Savik, any other comment from your side? Yeah, um, first of all, I, I'll approach it from a point of view of a white uh, male over 60. Um, I shouldn't be the, the uh, role model, but uh, the, the, the key point is here that we do not introduce biases in our judgment, in, in our management um, that will uh, put those barriers for women. So, for example, biased hiring processes that favor 
male candidates uh, or require qualification that women are less likely to have. So we have to be aware of those. And, you know, um, the awareness of our biases will help us um, improve the processes and improve that uh, gender balance. That, for example, if you look into the drinking water industry in the Netherlands, there is at the top level of directors, you get that it's quite balanced. And even I would imagine, I, I haven't counted them, but I think there are more women in those leadership positions. And that helps. Uh, I think um, that's what will give impression that it's not a closed shop. It's not all boys club, that water is also open to, um, to women. But I know the, the industry has a long history and previously um, you had uh, women leaving companies um, because of discrimination, harassment, um, the lack of uh, gender sensitive policies that is slowly being pushed out. Um, culture change uh, takes the longest. And I think, uh, again, because of our water industry uh, history, um, and maybe if you call it conservatism, um, that is going to take even longer. Yeah, and one thing I would well, add, I my, you know, what helped, I think what led me to water and sort of has, you know, stood with me was growing up my grandfather. Um, you know, I grew up in Jamaica. There's not a lot of folks in, in women in engineering and things like that. But my grandfather was a big proponent of, you know, getting more diversity in STEM fields. Uh, he was, you know, one of the first of his family, you know, fairly large family to go and do chemistry and things like that. So I grew up where he would bring chemistry sets. And, you know, I had a cousin who took me to his job as a coastal engineer and exposed me to those things. So when I had people telling me, oh, women don't belong in engineering or, you know, you, you, I, I know different, right? Because I was exposed to a lot of those things and people as a young age. So I think those are things that we can also um, do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ifitayu. And, yeah, uh, if I can jump in here too, Valid. Um, so to me, it's, it comes down to a lack of visibility both ways, right? Um, lack of visibility from the candidates to see the water space, but also lack of visibility of the candidates in the water space. Um, tell you a story. In my previous role um, as a CEO, I asked my recruiters to show me at least, introduce me to at least one candidate from a diverse background for every role we fill, and then me, the best person uh, or the most suitable candidate, get the role. And and they came up blank and told me it's hard. We don't have any diverse candidates which I find to be hard to believe. So to me, this is a lack of visibility. We don't see them. It's, and, and so then we can't offer those roles. And that's why, by the way, I started this um, initiative, Diversity in Water, to create visibility. I want to showcase their accomplishments so that we see them, so that when wonderful roles come around, it's not a we don't know who they are, but here's a whole pool of diverse candidates. And then to, to what um, was said earlier, right? It's also the inspiration, seeing other people from different backgrounds um, uh, accomplish amazing things that provides uh, a community of, of encouragement and support. Um, role models is another word, right? There Or peer-to-peer -peer inspiration for, for um, the idea of, I can do this. There's others like me. I'm not the only one that looks a little different or, or uh, the different gender, whatever the diversity criteria is. So I think... It's really critical that we create more visibility, um, both to the stories um, and celebrate those stories and accomplishments from the diverse candidates, as well as uh, make them visible to, to the roles we have. It's an excellent point, uh, uh, Mirka. And, you know, the, the challenge I see is that we, we talk about diversity. And, and when I was choosing the speakers, I picked you all for a reason, because I know you're all champions of diversity, you know, and, and you believe in it. And so, so can you give us examples of, of what your organizations are doing, are taking to promote gender equity? And, and also, have you seen any positive result out of this? Maybe if I, if I can jump in on this one, um, really what you, all, all the things you've said about, first we need to talk uh, about diversity and then we need to walk the talk. 
uh, that's clearly we need we need to to commit uh, we need to to explain to promote uh, to raise awareness around bias uh, which is quite quite key i'm from a generation where I, I do believe i do not have bias but then when i get a little bit deeper into that and when i get into training i, I discover a lot of things um we were speaking about talent pool when you are trying to reach your talent pool and and, and assessing it from 25 years old to 35 years old, you're missing all the women which are outside of the company because of pregnancy. And those were things that I was not at all aware about. And even I was considering myself quite um, quite not advanced, normal for my generation. So basically, this is a clear topic that Veolia and we in Veolia Water Technology has put on the agenda. So we, we commit 40% of our ex-co members are, are women. Uh, in operational roles and not only in support function when things that we could usually see in, in, in operational roles. We, we, we have put gender diversity, gender balance um, targets directly to the managers, not only in order to achieve it, but also as you were saying, how do you assess your talent pool? How do you make visible the invisible? How do you um, push women? How do you make sure that for each um position you are opening you have a woman um which can be interviewed how do you push for that even if at the end she might not have the job because there, there will be competencies and, and things like that but how do we make sure that we give equal chance to uh, to get to get the job so this is really what we what we are concretely trying to push and even more uh you were trying you were speaking before but I would say creating an appetite for the water sector, um, and and so my um, for 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 instance, um, the woman which is heading the engineering department in OTV, which is our French subsidiary, uh, every every three or four months she goes out with um, four other women in her team, and she goes to uh, college to high school uh, around the HQ where we are in order to explain what she's doing explain the jobs we are offering, explain what is the water sector, why science is open to women, but not only science, I would say, we, why the water sector is something on which people can commit and is a purposeful sector. And we, we have created this network in, in order to, I would say, to demonstrate this and to create, I would say, the future pipeline in five, 10 years of people that will apply uh, and that we would like to attract in our company. So we need to commit and we need also to have concrete actions, as you say, not only to speak about gender diversity or making diversity washing, uh, if I may say so, but um, also to make sure that things are done and understood by our managers as well. This is clearly also a cultural change in the water industry that we need to tackle. Uh, and, and this is also really what is at stake is this transformation. Yeah. It's the worst. The worst problem we have is when it, when it becomes like uh, people they don't believe in it. They think it's just management, you know, talk, and, and it's not really a cultural change. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think the cultural change part is really important. Um, I'll talk a little bit. I guess I kind of represent two organizations, and both of them, you know, have been really um, putting a lot of effort into DNI and recognizing the value of that. Um, on the Arcata side, we do have a goal that we've, you know, stated publicly of having forty percent of women. Um, in our workforce, we're pretty close to that. I think we're around like 38% or so. Our executive um, leadership, the executive board is, a, well, I think, majority women as of maybe later last year. Uh, but still, you know, I think we're doing pretty well of bringing them in um, and have made some strides of moving women into leadership that, that sort of in between, between the entry level and all the way up at the top. Um, you know, we've done quite a bit of focus groups and surveys in the last year. I think one thing we definitely we found was we had definitely made some improvements in moving women to leadership, but we were not seeing those gains for women of color. Uh, so now that has kind of led to the formation of a women of color program, um, you know, based on, you know, some we had a consultant, some extensive um, work with us to find out what some of those challenges were that women of color were facing of sort of getting into Arcadis, but then also moving up within Arcadis. So, you know, out of that program, we now are starting to have sponsorship, mentorship programs, really trying to, you know, get the faces visible um, and making some of those connections and trying to eliminate those barriers. So I'm 
hopeful, you know, I already saw that once we put the the targets there and the emphasis there, we did see some improvement. We're now recognizing some of the things or the folks that were left behind and trying to make um, you know, some particular focus on that so we can address those challenges as well. And then at WEF, similar goals on diversity, you know, we're striving for a pretty gender balanced um, leadership, um, that whether at the board or the staff level, um, and also in our programming, right? Because again, making sure that you're seeing balanced faces in, in our workshops or conferences and things like that. Um, again, mentoring, I through WEF mentor quite a few young women, especially women of color that I've come through, into contact through that organization and a lot of your, our young professionals um, programs that are really our pipeline to leadership. We put a particular emphasis um, on making sure that we have um, you know, diversity among all aspects so that our leadership eventually um, starts to look that way. And, and, and um, you know, as I said, the leadership really in both cases, I think, sets the tone and has to set the tone and, and others follow. So. Can I just yes, say Professor something Sam. about the, the same subject? Um, obviously, um, we've uh, gathered today on the occasion of the International Women's Day but uh, diversity and inclusiveness is, uh, uh, is uh, much wider and many more dimensions. Um, we're talking about people with disability, visual or um, any other uh, visible or invisible. Um, we're talking about uh, various ways um, that we have to, as an organization, Represent, be representative of what is happening in the society uh, where we live. Uh, in my organization, we have 40% uh, already uh, women versus 60% men, uh, but I'm still uh, trying to find out whether we represent the society we live in uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, so we have a scheme where disabled people get employment uh, through us, um, we have uh, increased recruitment uh, internationally uh, because uh, the Netherlands is very international in that sense. And uh, we used to be quintessential uh, Dutch organization. So various things are happening. And, but the, the first step as an organization we did is to ask people um, to do the internal survey to find out what they think about it, uh, whether they found anything that discriminated um, against them so that we can improve uh, those. And we have a work group that is focusing uh, on that through every level of the management within the organization. So, um, and uh, as the previous speakers, I mean, Arnold mentioned that, uh, that you have um, kind of targets and that's also what we're trying to uh, achieve. And it's kind of aspirational targets rather than you will be punished if you don't reach anything. Uh, so that uh, we have that flexibility in the system uh, with a clear understanding of everybody in the organization where we are aiming at. I, I, would, I would like to come back on mentoring because this is and mentorship because I think this is a key topic uh, that, uh, that could help we say exact for, for the for the for the women which are uh, inside the companies to, to to raise and to be more more visible. This is clearly something uh, we, we've launched launched a program which is called Women in Leadership uh, within Veolia, which is uh, helping or helping or mentoring women, not helping mentoring women uh, getting into new position or which are changing positions. Uh, and it was very, really a very powerful tool. And what we are trying to do also as well is to mentor the managers. Uh, because you can mentor the, 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 the woman, which is growing, but you have also to mentor, I would say, all the environment around. Uh, diversity is working on if people are well aware about what takes and, and, and the cultural challenges, once again, that is at stake. So it's not only women that needs to be mentored, but somehow the full organization that needs to move uh, globally, that needs to be trained and understand why uh, you were speaking about targets. Why do we put such targets? Because targets without mean without being meaningful are, are nothing. So this is really um, a journey that the organization needs to take. 
And Walid, if I can jump in here, I don't have uh, an organization of my own at this point in time, but certainly you mentioned earlier, I, I just recently founded Diversity in Water as something that has come to me. I have mentees, we've been talking a lot about mentees and mentors throughout the industry, women that found me and asked me for their support. And so I realized there's a need there and there's a need within organization and companies, but there's also a cross, in, um, cross industry need. And so that's my goal, just provide a platform across companies, a safe place where we can provide that emerging talent um, support, whether it is through mentors or through classes, role models, visual um, inspiration, um, groups, trainings, uh, whatever it takes, right, to encourage that next generation to uh, forge, forge their own path into this industry and, and accomplish great things. Oh, was a question from the audience. I mean, it kind of comment. So Daniel is making a comment about that. At the end of the day, we need to hire the most uh, competent person on the job. So the question is: there enough competent women in the water industry, or are there biases over hiring a man over a woman? So what do you think? I have my own take on this, but anybody wants to answer first. We, we need to define what is competent. <laughs> I think somehow, what, what do we mean the most competent person for the job? Sometimes we have, if I may, if I may speak from our organization, we, we were used to promote experts at managerial position because this is this was the way forward in the organization. But expertise and management are not the same skills, do not require the same skills, the same competencies and things like that. So really, yes, we will hire the most competent person, but we need to make sure that we address correctly the competence that we want at, at the position. And we need to make sure that maybe the most competent person is not the one applying. So we need, we need to, to, to search for the real good one which are not applying. Then yes, as we said, there might be a lack of women within the water sector. I will not say competent women, a lack of women in order to have the right pool once again, of talents, in order to be able to promote and to and to have those competencies on board. Uh, so this is really why, already at the start, at school, universities, and and, and, and this is where everything starts. Yeah, thank you, Arno. You know, talking about as, as you mentioned, like I have an example to share. So we're trying to hire two sales engineers, inside sales engineers, and the first deck I got. Uh, uh, with my managers, like the manager who was my hiring manager, was all about male. So I challenged them. I said, how come we're only having male as a shortlisted candidates? So we went again to, to all the applicants. It was like around maybe 200 CV, literally went one by one. And we were able to pull women. So my point is that there are competent women, but if you don't do an interview based on a, a, a fair slate of candidates, like, you know, like 50% women, 50% men, you will not end up having a competent woman on board. So the whole process ended up with having three candidates. There were two women and one guy in the top three, top three uh, ranking. Okay, we, we got the two ladies for, for different criteria. So they, they were better, doesn't mean the, the gentleman was not good. But my point is that we need to go the extra mile to be able to find the good and competent uh, employees. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, no, the answer is no, there's not enough women in water. Um, you know, 15% is not near enough of what it should be. Um, but there are many, many competent women in water. Um, and I think you also have to ask yourself the question, who's defining what competent is, right? And are you bringing your biases into that when you're deciding, you know, who, who, whose version of competent are you using when you're making that selection, right? So, uh, you know, challenging, you know, the folks, as you said, when you're looking at positions or where you're looking to find people to bring into the sector and into your workforce, are you just looking at your network, which may look exactly like you, or are you going out and finding the people that are there, right? And if there is, you know, and I think a lot of folks will, you know, I hear a lot of folks saying, we can't find them. Well, are you looking? Are you looking in different places, the places where they're at? Are you doing anything then to pull them in so that they're there for you to hire, right? You know, you can't just say, well, they're not coming out of university or they're not coming out of high school. Um, okay, well, what are you doing to make sure that they're do starting early and sort of getting the skills required to get into the sector? A lot of those things are really just excuses, I think. Um, but again, really challenging yourself also to think about what biases you have in your mind when you're deciding what's competent as well. 
I, I like this I comment. Just, from, yeah, go please, on. please go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say um, an example. We we had to hire somebody at the management level, and we went to the recruitment organization that specializes in uh, gender equity and and balanced um, uh, candidates. So. Um, as you said, um, the, the thing is, if you're looking just in a particular area where you know your own networks, you may be extremely biased. And we try to avoid that, but, but going to a specialist, um, and there aren't many. So that's very interesting. Yeah. I, I love this comment from uh, Jamal in Algeria. The real question is how to guarantee water for everyone, you know? So, and, and if we can pull, on all the talent pool available, why not? We should be. This is how we can guarantee, you know, water for everyone. It's a great comment. Thank you, Jamal. So, so you know, the water industry is evolving. In the next 10 years, it's, it's going to evolve drastically with opening. How, how do you see it impacting the gender dimension in our industry? I think, I mean, it's an opportunity, right? There's tremendous change coming. First of all, of course, there's the needs on the water side. And, and we all know the statistics that the UN is publishing. 1.2 billion people living in areas that are water scarce, 2.8 billion affected by water scarcity at least one month per year. Uh, Two thirds of the world population living in underwater stress conditions. Um, one out of nine people um, use drinking water from unsafe sources. So, I mean, we all know these statistics, right? So there's a need on the water space itself. Then adds to that some of the turmoil that we have all experienced in the past uh, years here, talk, talking about the pandemic, the consequent supply chain challenges, geographic disruptions and and, and, and stabilities, global recession. So, so there's a really dynamic space. So I say the new business as unusual is very dynamic. We need to expect the unexpected. It's always evolving. And so again, going back to my earlier comment, this is a time where we need novel ideas, where we can just use the playbook and say, well, we'll be fine. We need to look for inspiration in unconventional places in order to deal with some of these really interesting or ch tough challenges. And so that's where I think as you just said, we need to tap into all available talent and, and leverage the, the exposure and, and the understanding from different perspectives. And so I think it's an opportunity for more participation. It does require, though, that um, you're hiring someone that's different. Well, then expect them to be different, right? Expect them to make unique aha suggestions that wouldn't be mainstream. You need to uh, allow for those courageous conversations and not just hire someone that looks different or has a different background, but then expect them to do mainstream. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, well, this, this may be more hopeful than anything, I think, or what I'm, I hope I'm seeing in the next decade of, of water, but I see a lot of real commitment and you know, certainly I'm looking forward to the UN Water Conference in a couple of weeks, or well, maybe a little less than a couple of weeks now, where, and so, you know, you know, tying that in with WEF's new vision of a life free of water challenges, there's a lot of renewed focus um, and emphasis around the globe of making sure exactly that, right? That there's a lot of people who are still facing water challenges uh, around the world. And a lot of that is disproportionately burdened, by, um, felt by women, you know, who are going to gather water or who are, you know, tied up in sort of managing water and things like that. So as we're solving those water challenges, I think it really behooves us to make sure that a lot of those women or a lot more women are engaged in that process. Uh, and I think we'll be, we'll absolutely be better for it. But, um, you know, so I'm hoping over the next decade, we get much better at attracting the investment that's necessary for our sector at, you know, doing better at communicating outside so that we can get that investment so that we can get that workforce. And, and, and a lot of that hopefully is capturing um, a lot of people that are not historically in our sector that need to be in our sector so that we have more sustainable solutions and that we have less people that are facing water challenges, which in 2023 really should not be a thing, but still is. If I can go on that, there is, of course, a lot of opportunity. I see one big challenge, which is digital. Um, clearly, the water industry is moving, uh, of course, on digital solution in order to better manage to be, to be more efficient to fight against scarcity of water and, and quality 
And we have here also a challenge because the digital world and people and this, I would say, the scientific people working within the digital world have also their gender diversity challenge that we need also to tackle with them. Um, so we need to also to be to be to be careful on that. We we are quite lucky in uh, in, in Veolia Water Technology, our digital solu solutions, which are called upgrade. Uh, are built up and, and, and pushed by a team which is uh, nearly 50% women. So we are quite happy on that, but we see that the digital world is not completely gender diverse uh, yet. And, and, and this is a real challenge. Coming back to, to what you were saying on the water challenge, we, me, I see the, the water also at the nexus of all the ecological transformation in which we have to, to push and, and, and to live for uh, the impact around climate change, the impact around the pollution, all, all those impacts, they are much, much more complex than only water. And, 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 and they are pushing us to have more and more the society on board with us in order to tackle those issues. So yes, we need to have also more diversity within our companies in order to tackle the challenge with the society and having companies which are much more like the society. So this is, I would say, a, a great opportunity. And, and a third point, which is a bit aside, uh, but still uh, is will be a challenge, but maybe for all the businesses, all the work flexibility and, and the way our work habits have, have, habits have changed during COVID times, uh, the way we can handle and the way we have to be careful about work-life balance uh, is also for me a challenge that we will have in the next years with the new generation coming up and and, 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 and entering into the into our companies, even for us, which is not just a woman topic. Huh? It's it's also and it's really I would say a, an equilibrium for all our employees, uh, which we will have also to to tackle and to and and and, and to organize. And, and for me, this is sometimes work life balance uh, has been seen as a, as, a, as a woman topic. It has been pushed and has been I would say taken care of by the companies for a woman topic, but it's full of advantages also for men. So this is this is a way also gender diversity is not only an equity, should not seen should not be seen just as a benefit for women. It's a benefit for the whole companies and for the whole employees. Uh, and this is really what we what we have to push uh, also as well in the coming years. And this will be a challenge also. Correct. So valid. If I can say something about uh, the future, I would. Um, I'm always an optimist. If I look historically, um, the water industry, uh, if you look in the previous century, uh, where we started at the beginning of the century, I mean, women in the water industry were more of an exception than a rule. And we've gone a long way uh, towards achieving um, equity and equality. We're not there yet, obviously, but that's why I think the, the new generations will bring uh, more of that in um, and and this thing that we are working more flexibly will actually help women uh, come into uh, this industry. So um, yes, there will be lots of um, challenges that we have with sustainability in, in terms of um, uh, allowing um, enough water to be extracted, not to impact on the environment and looking into uh, various ways of uh, achieving the levels of services that we are, some of us are used to and some of us are aspiring to, that is going to be a huge uh, challenge. But as I say, I think, I, I hope, no, I'm sure actually that we will have much better uh, equity and diversity in the water industry, learning from the history. Yep. So you mentioned about attracting from different industries because we, the water is evolving. And uh, the interesting part is that today we're losing to the tech industry. So, for example, I had an employee who moved to Zoom, you know, because they are more uh, attractive as, as environment. So, so getting people to come from the digital world to our industry is a little bit more challenging. I think we need to focus on the social impact that we achieve in the water industry, like if, if, if the, the mission. This can be much more a bigger driver compared to just a, a office job. I, I have a question from Sandra Navarra. I've been holding on this question. 
because uh, it will lead me to the next question. So we talk about women in general, but then in the leadership space, how we can help them to, to get to senior level leadership, what are the unique challenges that women are facing? The question from Sandra is excellent. How, how can, can adv uh, how, what advice can you share with I think we lost valid, but uh, the question is still valid. So, you know, anybody wants to jump in. <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll start there because it's been part of my life for a long time, right? So um, I think one of the biggest challenges in, in attracting women to management levels is actually inclusion. It's the I of DEI. Um, we talked about the unconscious biases that help us to navigate and function in, or, in society, but that also cement maybe outdated stereotypes. And so, so what if I don't fit that mold of biases or stereotypes that are expected? And so female CEO, right? CEOs typically more identified with male characteristic. And so, you know, as a CEO, am I viewed as a man, as a male leadership characteristic? Do I need to become the best man in the room to, in order to prove myself? Or do I stay true to my maybe more female leadership qualities and, and, um, and, and leverage them, but then I don't quite fit the CEO role, right? But then I'm also female and, and, and I'm not quite typical in a female role either. I, I tell you from a personal experience, I'm not a hugger and, and I've had so many people come to me and, and looking for me more as the female and, and I'm not your mother, I'm not your caretaker, I'm your boss or your supervisor, right? And so what if that female you know, CEO, female manager, executive doesn't fit either of those molds, right? Then, then they, they disappoint one way or the other. And so then you hear things like, oh, she's too bossy. While if that was a man, he would be praised to be determined or she's so intimidating instead of just saying, oh, that's an um, um, ambitious new candidate. So. So that, that double-sided net, right? You're neither one nor the other. So we have to forge our own way of thinking uh, leadership for, for diverse candidates. And, and we talked about it before, right? We have to break those biases. And I think, again, the way to do it is to, to share those stories that we break up our um, limited understanding of what does good leadership look like? What does good executive look like? Because if you're one of those up and coming talents, Maybe you didn't even strive to be that traditional way of leadership, right? You want to live your unique qualities. And so allowing for that, which is, is again, it requires courage because you don't have those role models that might fit those different molds. And I think that's where we need to share the stories, um, but also provide the support, the inclusion to say, I'm not the only one, right? There's some other weird, weird character, characters like myself. And I find some, some support or some inspiration from others. Well, if I yeah, can I guess, also mention oh, that, sorry, go on. Um, no, I was just gonna answer, try to answer Sanja's question, although uh, a bit of a challenge, but increasing um, exposure, I would say probably not trying to focus so much on making sure that your ideas and your exposure is to higher manu management levels. I think just really trying to make sure that you expand your network and use every, um, you know, even for the introverted folks like me, using every interaction to really get to know, remember that you're working with people to get to know them, ask more questions on your projects, um, you know, try to expand your network as, as you as you work within your um, organization, but also outside of your organization. I think um, one of the things that has been really helpful for me in my career is really being exposed um, to across the sector, um, you know, it through my professional organization, the Wef the Water Environment Federation, and a lot of times I see, especially you know, if you are not just a woman, but a woman and you know something else, woman of color, woman with disability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it sometimes the first person time you met meet somebody who is like you is in a setting um, like a conference or something like that, and so really. I think a lot of my exposure came from participating in like those industry committees, um, doing presentations and papers, and then a lot of that recognition then ended up happening within my work. But I also really made a point as I was doing, you know, different um, projects and stuff like that to get to know um, and and establish um, relationships with the people that I was working with. Um, 
just really because you know the people in water are really great people but a, you know so in the end i think a lot of that has actually paid off in that i have a pretty good um network and a lot of my thoughts and ideas are seen i think they're certainly engaging in platforms like linkedin um there's a lot of people that will reach out to be through um and you know i think I also found that a lot of people in the sector are really helpful. And so reaching out to people um, to make a connection or to ask questions or things is another way of kind of building your network, building your exposure, um, because a lot of the people in the sector are actually really generous with their time because they actually want you to succeed. And they a lot of them have a vested interest really in wanting more people to come into the sector. So really taking advantage of that, I think. I agree. Networking is extremely important, but if you're looking within your own organization, um, I would say uh, talk to your uh, line managers. If they don't respond, go further up. Um, and if you cannot get to um, the top management or anybody along them, then you're in the wrong organization with the wrong culture uh, and look to find a more appropriate organization for you. I mean, what I've done uh, in, in KWR, I've introduced anonymous um, message box and anybody can uh, provide suggestions, ideas, criticisms in it. And I, as the CEO, has to respond to each and every one of them. So they know that. Everybody understands that. So they know they can get uh, to the top management with, uh, with their ideas. And I'm pretty sure there are lots of organizations that have that um, kind of approach to allow that innovation, particularly if you're looking into research, uh, innovation and impact, um, that they want uh, your ideas and they want to build on those. Yeah, and I think that's a good point in that we shouldn't be putting all the burden on that individual that you know is already sort of underrepresented to to find that exposure all the, you know like we you know in leadership need to also be accessible and go looking for those folks um to help them do that um and and make those sponsorship opportunities and stuff i think if if diversity is what we say we want um we also have to do some work uh so it, the burden shouldn't only be on especially you know junior level employees or those that are underrepresented to sort of get out there and be seen go look for them right like you can do that also yeah, de definitely it's up to the organization as well to create the opportunities. Huh? The, the first thing I was think, thinking as an advice is raise the hand when some projects are coming up, but the organization needs to come down and say, okay, we are launching some company's project. We are launching some projects. Who wants to participate? And let's go below the management line and get the talents up, uh, aboard. So, uh, and, and, and as you say, if you don't find this in the company in which you are working, then maybe it's not the right place to be. Huh? There is no sound. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I keep getting in and out of the call. I'm in South Africa, and you know, it's load shedding, so it's challenging. I'm lucky to be in the prominent uh, office today, so we had like a good interaction, and uh, in the service lab. So, so one of the comments I saw, if you mentioned about LinkedIn, I, I love LinkedIn. You know, I've had some of the best candidates on LinkedIn. You know, because you have the chance to see them, how they react, what they do, what they talk about, and so on. So it's it's really a good tool, and one of the advice I will give is that to learn to say no also, because sometimes if you're good, they will put everything on you, you know, and you will not have the time to grow your career. So learn to say no sometimes, you know, it's, uh, typically we push more on women versus, you know, men in, in, in our industry or any industry. So we still have like 10 minutes. I would, I would like to ask a, a question. What advice should you give to women who are considering joining uh, our industry? So because we talked about like how, how we need to attract them and also what qualities or skills they need to develop so they can have a successful career. I, I, if I may say so, I would say go for it. Uh, if, if you're looking for a job with purpose, if you're looking for a job which makes sense, if you're looking for challenges, which are not only engineering challenges, but um, communication, it's, 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 it's a sector where people are full of passion. So go for it. This is really a place where you can explore a lot of things and, and have a real impact on what's going on on, on, on earth and, and for the society. So 
really um, this is the place to be <laughs> if I may uh, if I may say it um, and 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 you were saying this also before and and be yourself in 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 in, in, in the way you will uh, handle it don't, don't try to be somebody else don't try to play the role of somebody else be yourself because this is what we will be waiting for uh, in, in the water sector I'll chime on in that um, so <clears throat> I, I totally agree authenticity is important right don't don't try to be the best man in the room but be the your self personal best in the room that requires self clarity. Well, what are your strengths and weaknesses, right? And, and play to your strength and, and take ownership of that personal growth journey by taking extra assignments or classes or opportunities um, that help to expand your experience and become more competent, right? We had that word before, no one is born competent. So get, gain those, have that ownership. We talked about connections and net network, the importance of, of making rich connections, networking to people that can be your promoters, your mentors, your role models, your inspiration. And I think all of that comes down to agency, right? You own it. Um, you, you can shape your life, your career. And I think the water space is a wonderful place to do that. Um, all of us are committed to the water space. So I would say become the pilot of your own life in water and, and uh, um, accomplish great things. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't say it better. Um, the water sector is that, right? It's, there's, there's not many other sec sectors or jobs that you can really have that much of an impact on the environment and on people uh, because it's such a growth. Well, you know, pretty much critical um, factor for life, right? So, um, and the people in it are really there, you know, I really find that that's what they're there for, that they are there to um, to remove those water challenges that they see in their community or, you know, other communities and stuff like that. And and they really have that purpose. So it's it's just an amazing career um, with a, a but, um, amazing set of people, I think. I've, I've rarely read people that are not nice or not really collaborative. Um, in this space versus a lot of other um, sectors. So I, you know, definitely consider entering um, to try to add to what others said, because I certainly agree um, wholeheartedly with what was said already. Um, you know, technical skills are good, but really also I think uh, the people who I see have really succeeded and moved to the top have really worked on like their communication skills, their project management, their people management skills, right? And then sort of adding to that it, in the face of the challenges that we have, and since we are talking about women today, really the understanding of equity um, in the work that we do, uh, who has historically not been served or maybe overburdened by some of the work that we've doing, and how can we sort of unpack that and and change the way that we're doing stuff. I think there's a great opportunity for us to um, correct some of the imbalances that we've had as we've delivered water services. So that's another um, emerging topic and important thing in the water sector. And then just really keeping in mind ultimately who we're serving, which is you know people in the environment um, as we do uh, the work that we do. Um, I think those, you know, keeping some of those things top of mind and honing those um, skills and levels of understanding, I think, is what will make you a better water um, professional. And, um, you know, the technical skills, they're there, but it can't be the only thing, um, uh, especially if you're trying to, like, stay and move up in the sector. So. Yeah, maybe talking about diversity, we should mention that uh, our industry is extremely diverse. If you look into the technological side of things, anything from microbiology, chemistry, infrastructure, uh, treatment, um, environmental uh, considerations, to the societal kind of side of things, the, the user, the user behavior, and uh, how they, they see the services they receive from the industry, and if you think then about background of people, almost anything, any activity, any profession, you can find it in the water industry. I don't know about musicians, maybe not, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, um, uh, I want to get across how diverse uh, the requirements of the water industry uh, are. 
previously only technical, only technological, but we have grown into much wider kind of uh, socio-economic uh, and environmental uh, in, uh, conscious industry. And that's where uh, anything from digital, anything from uh, social sciences, anything from technical scientists uh, will be uh, useful to have that practical impact on the society. Thank you. You, you know, uh, on the music side, uh, at WEFTEC, every year there is a big concert, you know, by the musicians in the water industry. There is a play. They can find all the play. To <laughs> yeah, but I agree there's a huge diversity. Like, just on the school, you saw, like, the countries where we have people from all these countries, and, and they're all on the same mission, you know, providing uh, water quality and, and to, to everyone. We still have a few minutes. I would, I would like to ask this question uh, from Robin. Uh, and this is to Arno, but I think anybody can answer also. So you mentioned you followed some trainings that made you realize your unknown biases. So do you recommend something on that topic? No, I, I, it was a, a training done in French by uh, Patrick Charnitsky, which is somebody which is working a lot of stereotype and bias. But if, if I have some time, I will share with you uh, uh, another personal anecdote. Um, I went out of one of those trainings saying, OK, in fact, the idea is not that it's an issue to have bias, but you need to make sure that you recognize that you have bias in order to, to work with them and to tackle them. And we were discussing with my daughter. She's 15 and she's wondering what she will do for a living. And she's really good at science. Uh, so she told her that she wants to be a medic. Uh, she wants to go into a medical school and, and, and do things like that. And we were saying, yeah, that's really great. And then I, I give a thought about that. And I thought, if it was my boy, which was telling me that, would, wouldn't I tell him that he needs to go to an engineering school? And, and because we, we, we think, OK, science, woman, care. Uh, boy, uh, science, engineering. And, and, and even if I once again think that I'm from a generation which is quite open on that, it strokes me that I didn't talk about engineering school with my daughter. So I went back to her. And I said, maybe you need to explore new fields just to broader your area. And I know she's quite willing to go to an engineering school, but this is what it takes, I would say, on, on the private side also to fight every day against those bias which are putting people in a box and saying this is where, where you belong. So th this also <laughs> is a bit... It's a great example, yeah. Arno. I mean, yeah, please. Yeah, no, no, I was saying that there's probably, you know, there's a lot of training and written material around bias and stuff that I'm sure you can find from Google. I think the other thing that's important is that, you know, especially leaders within the organizations really set that um, table or set the stage so that they are, they, women or other folks who are underrepresented can actually bring up biases and when they do, that we acknowledge that and acknowledge that it's real and not get defensive and work to address that. Um, I think you really have to set sort of the, the conditions within your your own organization that people can actually bring up, you know, what the actual biases that do occur um, so that you can tackle them. But as far as like general um, courses or even stuff around bias in water, I'm sure you can find them just from looking. There are tons of articles and tons of um, you know, training and videos out there. You just have to search for them. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to close because we're running out of time. I would like us to close with this comment from Isabel. And it's very encouraging because all the work we're doing is, is showing. So she's saying that she has worked in different industries and, and she, she came to conclusions that she has to express her appreciation to the water industry. She's yeah. been seeing a really rapid change in the last five years to embrace gender equality. I mean, it's, it's, it's a journey. It's not like, you know, we're not there yet, but I agree with her. We, we're seeing a lot of progress. And I want to thank you, especially for joining this call. I know all of you have very busy schedules. Still, you manage to find the time to commit and, and come and hopefully inspire more people to join or even stay, retain people in the industry and even grow their careers further. And also, I would like to, share, to thank all of our attendees because the time zones can be very complicated when you are having a virtual meeting. So... Thank you all. I really uh, appreciate you joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>